Hey, happy Memorial Day weekend to everybody. Uh, you probably have some big plans this weekend. Uh, Memorial Day is a day where we remember uh, the fallen uh, veterans, uh, those military men and women who have served our country. So uh, we, we are grateful for them. Uh, we also recognize those of you who are currently serving or uh, living and are retired from the military. Uh, we commend you guys also, you men and women, for your service. If you are currently in the military or have ever served, would you please stand so we can recognize you? <laughs> Amen. We, we are grateful for your service and your sacrifice. Uh, it takes a lot for uh, you to do what you do, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, today, we are talking about uh, a different kind of memorial. Uh, we are talking about the memorial of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So today's message is titled, Remember Me, the Lord's Supper. And it comes from the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 14. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, you can take the one that's in the pew. Uh, if you have a smartphone, a tablet, or, or anything like that, then you can follow along on the YouVersion Bible app. All of the scripture and some of the major points for today will be found uh, there. Just go to events, and you'll see Britain Christian Church there, and you can follow along with me in real time. Now let's begin with Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 14. When the hour had come, he, that being Jesus, sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined or as it has been prophesied. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they, the disciples, began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. We thank God for his word. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for your word. And according to your word, it is true. And by it are men sanctified. And so, God, that's what we are asking for you to do today. To keep your promise, to be faithful, God, to sanctify us by your truth. We pray for transformation Today, God, we pray for salvation for those who do not know Jesus to come to know him today personally and in a real and tangible way. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would show up and that you would do so in power, breaking the chains of our bondage. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, each week, you and I have the, the privilege and the pleasure of eating uh, from the Lord's table, taking part in one of our most holy acts of worship, communion. It's also referred to as the Lord's Supper and the Holy Eucharist. Now that last one uh, you may be a little unfamiliar with, but the word Eucharist comes from a Greek word, Eucharisto, meaning to give thanks. For today, I'm only going to use two of those terms. I'll use the first two, communion and the Lord's Supper, to talk about one event, to talk about the same thing. So I'll use those interchangeably this morning. 
in case you're wondering. I thought he said communion, but isn't that the Lord's Supper? So just so that you all know what's going on. Now we learn about the importance of this act of worship, communion, by reading the synoptic writings of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We'll also find this in Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth um, in chapter 11. Now surprisingly, at least to me, um, John doesn't give us a lot of detail about the bread and the wine in his gospel. What John tends to focus on is the foot washing, um, not so much the bread and the wine. And what John points out there is something that Jesus uh, told us himself, that he had come to serve, not to be served. So in, in John's gospel, he, he tends to focus or highlight the humility with which Jesus served and lived among his people. Now, this whole event uh, that we find in Luke chapter 22 is happening during what is known as the Passover, uh, which really is the beginning of an eight-day celebration known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread was celebrated by all Jews. Now, Passover marked uh, the final plague in Egypt when the firstborn male children of Egypt were all killed uh, in an act of judgment upon them because Pharaoh refused to let the people of God leave Egypt, he refused to release them from their slavery. Now, the, the Israelites, though, they were spared. They were unharmed because in their obedience to the word of God, they smeared the blood of a lamb, a spotless lamb, on the doorpost of their dwelling. And so whenever the death angel would come to that place, if he saw or she saw this, um, this blood on the doorpost, then the angel would pass over that place and spare the lives of the people who were in there. The blood covered them. It saved those people. Now, the unleavened bread reminded the people that um, they had no time to waste in Egypt. There was no time to let the bread rise. And like I told the first service, for many of us last night, um, and the people in the path of the storm, uh, they know what that's like. There's no time to fool around. You get to the shelter and get to your safe place as quickly as possible. And so the Israelites uh, are doing the same thing. The unleavened bread doesn't rise because they have to get out of there in a hurry. And so annually, large crowds of Jews would gather in Jerusalem, and they would celebrate this feast commemorating that time in Egypt when they fled, uh, when the angel passed over their homes. On Monday, Thursday, and we celebrated that here uh, just during the Holy Week, uh, Jesus and his disciples are sitting at the table, or, or really they are reclining at the table, and they're eating the Passover meal together. And it's at this time that Jesus looks out into the room, and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And the entire mood changes. Everybody starts to question, who is it that's going to betray Jesus? And who would do such a thing to betray this man? John chapter 13, verse 24, uh, in that verse we learn that it was the apostle Peter who motions to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now that was John's own confession. Jesus never actually said that about John. Uh, but it's John, the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, Peter asked him, hey, find out from Jesus who he's talking about. And so Jesus, after he dips bread into the cup, and he offers it to Judas. Judas looks at him and says, there must be some mistake. Surely it's not me, Rabbi. But it was. You see, Jesus used the Old Testament Passover meal to explain his coming death. And he gives the bread and the wine an, an entirely new meaning. And for many of us, uh, may be unaware of this, but during the Passover, there were four cups, or um, they called them pouring, so they would pour uh, four times into a cup uh, during the meal to commemorate 
or to represent really the promises of God to deliver his people. Here are the four promises. Number one, God's promise that I will bring you out. Number two, I promise to deliver you. Number three, I promise to redeem you. And finally, I promise to take you as my people. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection made the celebration of Passover no longer about the Jews' exodus from Egyptian slavery, but now in the Lord's Supper, what it commemorates is our own escape from the bondage of sin, reminding us of our Lord's death on the cross, while at the same time, the anticipation that he will return. Now this morning, I want us to wrestle with three questions, basic questions. Uh, the first one is this, why? Why do we come to this table every week? Why do we eat communion? The second question is, who is invited to the table? Who gets to fellowship with the Lord at this table? And finally, question number three is, how are we to take communion? In what manner are we to approach the Lord's table each week? And I realized something, and you may be thinking this too. Trey, those are some basic questions, very simple questions with seemingly obvious answers. However, I'm convinced that you and I have to be reminded of the sacredness of communion so that we avoid trivializing the grace of our master. So let's begin with our first question. Why? Why communion? And this too is obvious. We take communion simply because Jesus Christ has commanded that we do so. It reminds me of when I was growing up and my mom would tell me to do something. I would say, Mom, why? And most of the time, she would say, because I told you to. I didn't get an explanation. Like, just do it because I told you to. My own kids, they have heard that more times than they can count. If they had a penny for every time I told them that, man, they'd be rich. So here we are. Jesus commands that we take communion. And we find this command in Luke's gospel as well as in uh, 1 Corinthians. Here it is in Luke. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, and he had given, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And there it is. It's clear from these verses that we are commanded to do this. Now, the word do that is used in these verses is in what is known as the present indicative active voice. That means, for those of you uh, who may be wondering, I had to look it up myself. But it means that at the time that Jesus is making this command, he's given this commandment. He intends for it to happen at that very moment, but to be repeated continually into the future. And so what that means for you and me is that this act of worship, of communing with God at his table, is not optional. It is our obligation as followers of Christ to eat from the Lord's table and to worship him in this way. And yet, not only are we eating from the Lord's table, communing with him because he has commanded us to do so, but also because it reminds us of him. On the table, it's inscribed, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus commanded us so. Do it and let it remind you of me specifically. And so we'll break that down. There are two things specifically that I would focus on uh, in regards to remembering the Lord through this act of worship. The first one is this. I believe that communion reminds us 
of the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. Communion reminds us of Jesus' ability and capability to save. His body is represented in the bread that we eat. It was Jesus who said, this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. It was given for you and it was given for me as the singular atoning sacrifice for our sins. There is no other sacrifice. But John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 tells us that he didn't just do it for you and for me, but also for the whole world. In the cup, we're reminded of the shed blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, his blood which was poured out for many for the remission of sins. And the cup of his blood establishes a brand new covenant. The Hebrew writer tells us that when he says a new covenant, Jesus has made the first one obsolete. It's outdated and ineffective. And if any of you have gotten a notification about updating your software on your phones or your tablets or whatever, uh, you know what we're talking about. The old stuff doesn't work with some of the new functions. And so you got to get an upgrade. You have to update that stuff. Here, Jesus has done the same thing with the covenant. In doing so, he has made the first one ineffective, no longer useful for you and me. In the Passover, the lamb was slain for one family, or maybe two, and it all depends on the size of the family. And you can see that in Exodus chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He says, speak, can you go back one, Angela? Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. And this they did every year, repeatedly. In the Lord's Supper, we are reminded that the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world, offered his body one time, and he did it for all people. The writer of Hebrews goes on to tell us that after Jesus had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, that he sat down at the right hand of God, perfecting for all time those who are being sanctified. So as we eat, as you and I fellowship at the Lord's table, we are reminded that Jesus alone is the source of our lives. Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 53 and 58 to 58, that if we do not eat his flesh, if we do not drink his blood, we have no part with him, and there is no life in us. Communion reminds us of the redeeming power of Jesus. It reminds us of our own salvation. But not only that, the second thing is that it reminds us of the Lord's promise to return. Jesus is coming back. The second coming of Jesus is one of those uh, things in church, one of those doctrinal points where uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of arguing, heavy debating about when Jesus is going to return. And this is taking place within the church. Now, while there may be confusion and arguing about when Jesus is going to return, we can be encouraged that the church is unified in the belief that Jesus is coming back, as he has promised. That one day he will return to earth. Even Jesus referenced this. He pointed to this on the night of the Last Supper, as he spoke to his disciples, talking about a parousia, a second coming, a time in the future when there would be a reunion between him and his followers. Listen to what Jesus says. I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. Until is a comma 
in this century. Not a period. Jesus is coming back. And so when we eat and we drink from the Lord's table, we should do so anticipating his return. Paul challenges the believers in Corinth with this. And you guys have heard this uh, often. He says, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Now, the second coming of Jesus is going to be a day of great joy. But it's also going to be a day of great judgment. It's going to be a day of joy for you and me whose lives, according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, whose lives are hidden with Christ in God. But it's going to be a terrible day of judgment for those people who have trusted in anything beside Jesus Christ. And so, church, as you and I, we rejoice in our own redemption when we come to this table. We remember the sacrifice of Christ, his redeeming power for us. We must also remember that there are people who are not at this table, people who are lost in their sins. And we need to reach out to those who have not yet surrendered to the love and grace of our master. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who wait for him eagerly, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, only for salvation. Communion reminds us, again, of our redemption through Jesus, and it reminds us of his promise to return. Now let's go on to our second question. We know why we eat it. Uh, but who gets to eat? Who is invited to this table? And that may not be something you've ever asked yourself. Uh, but today, uh, we need to deal with that. I remember when I was a kid, um, I'm from Louisiana, and so there are two kinds of people in Louisiana, Baptists and Catholics. That's it. You're, you're one or you're the other. Um, and so my mom raised us Baptists. And in the church that I grew up in, you could only take communion if you had done two things. One, you had to confess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you had to be baptized. So it wasn't until my first baptism that um, I got to take communion with the church. Now, I, I go over to the other side of our family, uh, on my, my mom's dad's side, and then on my dad's side, uh, most of those people are Catholic. And on occasion, I got to go to church with my Catholic family. And when I would be there, I always thought that it was strange. They never let me take communion with them. That just puzzled me. I was like, well, I'm Christian too. I'm like, you know, you're Christian, and so why do you get to worship God in this way, but I don't? Because I wasn't Catholic, simply because I wasn't Catholic, I was not allowed to worship God uh, in the Lord's sup Supper. You know, that kind of, uh, this, this understanding, especially my Baptist background, it, it, later it impacted when I would allow my own kids to take communion. Um, my son Elias was baptized. He confessed faith in Jesus at about three years old, but it wasn't until he was six years old he was baptized, and my Baptist roots I just dug my heels in, like, we're going to wait until he's baptized. And then at some point, I realized uh, when my son Silas confessed his faith in Jesus Christ, I was like, why, if he believes in Jesus, why would I not let him participate in this act of worship? And so uh, God dealt with me on that, and I switched um, my belief. And here especially if you're visiting with us this morning, at Britain Christian Church, we believe and we really are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that this table is open to whosoever believes in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Eating from this table does not mean that you are a member of this particular congregation. What it signifies is that you have pledged allegiance to Jesus and to him alone. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all take partake of that one bread. And when Paul uses the word we, he is talking about the church. He is talking about the body of Christ, the redeemed, those who have been washed in the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Those people are invited to eat from the Lord's table this morning. Bobby Jameson is the author of a book, uh, Understanding the Lord's Supper. And he says this about communion. He says that the Lord's Supper defines the identity of the church and therefore the membership of the church. Those who eat form one body and only those in Christ should eat it. And I totally agree with Bobby. If we have not accepted the atoning work of Jesus Christ on our behalf through his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, then we are unclean, the Bible says, and our sin remains. And I would advise this morning that anyone who is not a believer, if you know you're not a Christian, uh, you are unsaved, I advise that you do not eat from the Lord's table this morning. And now, let me pause right there, because I want to, I want to offer uh, an invitation to you. And today, we're shaking things up. Things are uh, a little uh, inverted today. We usually wait until the end of the service to do an altar call. But there may be some of you here this morning who have never trusted Jesus for your salvation. And so at this time, if you're here, uh, I want to extend the invitation to you to do that. Uh, come down to the front and give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart, and we will welcome you into the fellowship of God and his people. So if you're here this morning and you know you're not a Christian, but you want to make that step of faith, would you come at this time? And I'll wait for you. This is a good day. This is the day of salvation, the word of God says. So don't wait. Well, since we're all family, I'll move on to the last question. My final question is this. How do we approach the Lord's table? Since we're all believers in here, in what manner are we to fellowship with Christ at this table? In just a few minutes, um, I'm going to call the deacons and the elders up, uh, and we'll have an opportunity as a church to worship God in eating the bread and drinking the juice, which represents our Savior's body and his blood. Just as the disciples had to prepare to eat the Passover meal with Jesus, so must you and I prepare ourselves to eat from the Lord's table this morning. And instead of going through the robotic motion of grabbing the cracker and the juice and slamming it without a thought, I really want us to pause and to consider what our salvation has actually cost. What does that mean for us to be saved by Jesus? And I also want you to ask if there's anything that, that you, have, any sin that you have in your life, anything you haven't confessed to God, um, this is a great time for you to confess those things, to pray and to ask God like David to search your heart, to know you and to see if there's any wickedness within you, and to deal with that stuff before you ever come to this table. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, Paul says that we are to examine ourselves first, and then we are to eat and to drink uh, the bread and the cup. Self-reflection 
is something that's supposed to take place all throughout the week, from Monday to Saturday and into Sunday before we ever come to this table. But since we're here on Sunday, we certainly need to reflect before we eat. Paul goes on to say in his second letter that we must examine ourselves to see whether you are even in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you unless he's not. Is basically what that means. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless he's not and you have failed the test? You have been found disqualified. When we come this morning, we should ask ourselves, do I even believe in Jesus? Do I really believe that the bread and the juice are symbols of the, the means by which grace has occurred and salvation has occurred on, on my behalf? Those who eat, Paul says, without believing in Jesus Christ, do so in an unworthy manner, and we bring judgment upon ourselves. Judgment which may result in sicknesses or weaknesses or even in death. As we come to the table, we need to do so in faith and in humility, trusting in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ as our substitutionary sacrifice. So if the deacons and elders would come up uh, and join me at the front, uh, as they're coming, I want to close with a thought that really hinges from our, our opening with the Passover cups or the Passover pourings. Remember this, the Lord's promises, that one, he promises to bring you out of the bondage of sin. Number two, he promises to deliver you from the punishment of death. Number three, he promises to redeem your life. And finally, remember that the Lord promises to return for you and to take you, who once were not the people of God, to be his prized possession, his peculiar people, and a royal priesthood. Before we eat, I want us to quietly reflect upon the grace of God that has been extended to us. And as we do that, um, I'll pray, and then we'll administer these elements. And just quietly acknowledge to God how grateful you are that he would do this on your behalf. Uh, the word of God tells us that this is how God demonstrated how much he loved you, how much he loved me that he let Jesus Christ go to the cross in your place. You deserve to be there, not Jesus. He became sin, not knowing sin, so that we all could become the righteousness of God through him. The prophet Isaiah says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon Jesus Christ all of our sins, all of ours. And so this morning, we get to celebrate and worship God in eating this bread that represents his body and drinking this juice that represents his blood that was given and poured out for us. But not only for us, for those who are not at the table, also the whole world. So if you would pray uh, quietly, uh, we'll take a moment before the elements are given. Father, we thank you this morning for your eternal grace, your mercy which you have shown to us. God, we thank you for Jesus, for his obedience 
unto death, even death on the cross, the cross that was ours to bear. God, we thank you that you have not abandoned us, but that you will return to take us as your very own people. Oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be for those who are redeemed, for those who have trusted in Jesus. But God, we are reminded that there are some, even in our own families and circles, God, who do not know Jesus. And God, we pray that today you would speak to them. We pray, God, that you would cause them to surrender to your love and your grace. There's nothing lost by trusting in Jesus, but everything is gained. God, thank you for this reminder. And may we never forget what our salvation has cost you when we come to this table. Thank you for making us one body, for making us one bread, one community of faith through Jesus Christ and his blood.